yes, we have a master track, but where is it? What, what, what's going on here? When you're starting out with GarageBand on Mac, especially if you're coming from GarageBand iOS, there's some differences. And I've been playing around for the last week and discovering all those differences for myself. And I thought I would show you what I've learned. This is a little track that I put together. If you are a patron over at patreon.com slash Pete Johns of mine, you would have seen this. I did an hour and a half live stream where I kind of used trial and error. And the first thing that I came across here was, okay, when you're creating an empty project, you probably want to do this setup. This is a good thing because in GarageBand on iOS, you have to actually set this up after you've created the project. Whereas in Mac, you can get yourself a little bit more dressed for success, so to speak. So we're going to do this. We've got an empty project here. We can set our tempo straight away. So if you wanted to say, make it 110, or you can tap it in. So boom, do, do, do. Let's just say we're going with the tempo around about like this, about 114. We can change this from C major to whatever we like. So I'm usually in G major, it's my favorite key. And four, four time, five, four, you do have all the variations here. So I was gonna say, should we make it five, four times? Should we make it, easy? we'll leave it four, four. But it is nice to see that we have those. This is the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is your input and your output device. So this is really handy that here in GarageBand on Mac, we have the ability to have different input and output devices. How cool is that? So if you wanted to just plug in a microphone that's a USB mic, for instance, and then you wanted your audio to just come out of your regular headphone jack on your Mac, you can do it. If like me, you've got both an audio interface, I've got my Scarlett 2i2 plugged into my Mac and a mixer, you can do that. And this is why it makes it so easy for me to do these tutorials is I can have the input going through my Scarlett, the output going through my mixer. And if you had two different interfaces, you could do exactly the same thing. Now keep in mind, you can hit some latency things because you're obviously using two separate USB devices. So do keep that in mind, but we're gonna leave it that way for now. So we've got that all set up. We're gonna hit choose and we've got ourselves a new project. We're opened up into a new project and we get to choose what sort of track we put in here. So I'm just going to uh, put in a software instrument track to start with. So we, we can select it here. And as you select each different track, it gives you different options down the bottom there, which is important to keep in mind. Software instrument track, hit create, and we're ready to start creating. Now, uh, I wasn't gonna cover it in this one, but you can see here we got this musical typing keyboard. So we could actually type there. Let's turn the volume up so you can hear it too. And it's put us into our default electronic piano here. Now, to get this typing keyboard up here, it is just Command K. I'm pretty sure there's a menu option up here. I haven't learned it yet. Command K. I think it was Dean Davis or Patrick at the Garage Band Guide. I've been watching me some videos. So I think that's how I learned that we had that there. So the next thing that I normally do in iOS is I start looking at sections and regions. And if you've been following me in the iOS world, you know that I'm always banging on about this because it's so much easier when you're setting up a track to set it up into sections here. So we can set sections like this and then you can make sure that, you know, section A is your intro, section B is your verse, section C is your chorus. You can't name them because who knows why, but then it just makes it easier that if you then want to edit, you want to shuffle things around, change your order, you want to change the number of bars in each section, you can do all of this. We've lost it. <laughs> iOS is getting sad because we're not using it anymore. On the Mac, we don't have sections. And I got really confused with this to start with until some very wise people told me that there is something here called an arrangement track. Yes, an arrangement track, and it works a treat. So what we need to do is go here to the track menu, and we want to actually show arrangement track. And what this does, see this little thing that's popped up here? We've now got ourselves an arrangement track, and we can actually hit the plus button here, and it will actually add in different sections. So we can hit the plus, and it will add in a section, and then we can actually come in here and change this around. We can move the sections. So we can say, all right, our intro is these first sort of five bars, and then we've got our verse section that's gonna go from there to say there, and then I think you can even right click, can we? I'm, I'm still learning this stuff, folks. We're learning as we go. Uh, so we can hit plus there, and there's our chorus. I think, yep, so if you tap on it there, you can change the name, so we can call it that. I noticed that they didn't have some names, so when we were doing something before, something like the pre-chorus wasn't there. So you can set all that up. Now, you can do this at the start, as I've done here, or you can do it post, and that's the cool thing. If you don't set up sections, if you just hit record and go, you can use your arrangement track and set that up after the fact. So I actually think that's pretty cool. It's probably better than sections. It's a little bit harder to find because it's a bit of a hidden feature, but I think it's better than sections in my experience. Let's talk about file management, because the one thing that I've found here about GarageBand on Mac is that by default, it'll actually save your files onto your Mac 
it won't save them to iCloud Drive. And there doesn't seem to be, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, there doesn't seem to be a way to, I mean, there's an iCloud thing here. It doesn't seem to be a way for us to actually have our default location as iCloud Drive. So when you first start with GarageBand on Mac, keep that in mind. Because if you start creating project after project after project, you're using the default save location, it's not backing them up. Sure, if you've got a time machine backup or if you're doing an iCloud backup manually, it'll work. But what I've started doing, and this seems to work for me, is that when I'm creating a new project, I'm actually saving it. Instead of saving it here in my standard, you know, Apple Music GarageBand folder, I'm coming over here to iCloud Drive and I've set myself up a GarageBand Mac uh, project here. And we can save this as, we'll just call this uh, Chest Setup. And we're going to save this right here on my iCloud Drive. That means it's going to be accessible from wherever I go, uh, which is going to be cool. So now that we've saved this, we've got ourselves set up. We've saved it into iCloud Drive to make sure it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, what else have we got to do here? One thing that I got caught up with when I was first using GarageBand on Mac is that I kept putting this on. I kept accidentally putting on my little looper here. What is this called? The cycle recording button. So if you are doing this like me, if you hit the C button, it'll put the cycle recording on there. And then when you go to record, instead of it just recording straight, when it gets to the end of that cycle, it stops and rewinds and goes back to the start. So that is, yeah, that that is a bit of a pain because I generally don't like doing cycle recording. So it's just more of a tip for, for newcomers that because we don't really have, you can record in a, inside a section within GarageBand iOS, but you can't really do it in an actual cycle like that. So it will be handy, and for doing multiple takes of the same thing, I can see this being handy in the future, but seeing it's something that I don't often use, just make sure that if that yellow light comes on, the cycle recording's on. I did it probably three or four times the other day, <laughs> and it was a bit of a pain in the butt. Now, most of your audio interfaces are going to be 24-bit, even if they're not 24-bit. If you're using samples or loops or virtual instruments or anything that's gonna create audio, just turn on 24-bit. 16-bit is okay, but 8-bit is more, right? You're getting a third more audio resolution, which means your quieter parts and your louder parts can have more dynamic range. You can get better quality sound. So turn it on. So how do we do that? Well, thank you, Mark, who's reminded me. It's under GarageBand. It's under Preferences. And here it is. It is this one here. It is 24-bit audio. While we're here, let's look at the other super important one that I talked about recently. I talked about GarageBand iOS and the fact that it doesn't have the ability to turn off its auto normalization function. It is a pain in my backside and I wish it was different. I have, there's tips around how to do this. I had a video last week. Go back and check that one out if you need to. It's what to do when your projects are too loud in GarageBand. However, GarageBand Mac comes to the rescue because see this auto normalize here? See how I can turn it off? Yeah, that's what we can do. So with that on, it'll export projects at full volume. And as it says there, when you export a project, auto normalize increases the volume if needed so the project is not too quiet. So if you're recording everything at say minus 12 and your peaks are only going up to minus 12, it'll bring your peaks up to zero and just increase the volume of your whole track. It doesn't mention it here, but it also does another thing, which is if you're over zero dB, so if you've got your volume up too loud, not only does it normalize, well, it does kind of normalize, but it uses a, a limiting algorithm, or at least we think it does. Apple don't tell us this stuff, but we think it does, which will actually push down your peaks. And that's where you can get that distortion and that pumping at the top of your volume. And I hear it time and time again, especially with drums. People put their drums up too loud. Instead of using compression, they just bump the volume. And then when it hits into the chorus, everything is too loud. So if, you, if you've ever heard that thing where someone's singing and, and their voice is going like this, it's like, and then we went to the and every time the snare cracks or the kick drum kicks, it goes quiet. That's that pumping you get from limiting and usually it's something like this. So turn that one on, turn that one off. Yes, we have a master track, but where is it? What, what, what's going on here? Uh, to demonstrate this, let's, uh, let's go and open a different file. So we're going to open up this one here that I did my Rugrats remix. And yes, it was a remix of the Rugrats theme, which means we probably won't play it. Uh, we'll save our other project there. This is something that we put together before. And you'll notice that we already have all of these additional tracks here. See these ones here? We've got the arrangement track, movie track, transpose track, tempo track. And down here, we have a master track. And on your master track, you can add plugins, you can turn it up and down. You can, I don't know why you'd ever solo it because it's all your tracks. And you can even change your panning. I don't know why you'd ever want your master track panned one side or the other, but there you go, you can do it. Oh, there you go. I've just learned that double clicking on your panning knob 
doesn't bring it back to zero, it gives you an option there. So you'd have to put zero in there. Okay, that's a thing. Who knew? Let's say that this is getting too loud and I'm like, oh no, I've got to go here and turn down each individual track. Well, no, we don't because we've actually got the master track option. So how do we enable it? Once again, track up the top here, show master track. So I didn't even know this. When I did this song, I didn't know this was a thing. And now we've got complete control here. So if this is getting too loud, we can just simply turn it down. Pretty cool, huh? So it gives you the ability to do that. But then, of course, you can add things like, and it's already got in here, like a limiter. We can throw a limiter here on our master track. So you can do some basic mastering right here in the original project without exporting, without doing anything else. It's all right there at your fingertips. So I think that's pretty darn cool. Your transpose track, which is pretty darn cool. If you go to track here, we can actually go show transposition track. And look at this, we can actually transpose. And now this will only work with your virtual instruments. So if you're doing a track like this, that's got you know, recorded instruments as well, probably not a great idea, but you can actually add in transposition points to actually transpose your tune. And the other one that we have here, this is pretty cool, is the tempo track. So under track, show tempo track, we can actually add in tempo changes in here. So check this out. We can not only add in changes like that, where it goes from one tempo to another, but we can even ramp the tempo. Look at that. You can ramp the tempo from say 112 to 125. So if you ever wanted to create a song where it changes tempo as you go along, that's exactly what you can do, which is cool. Final tip that I'll show you here is don't forget Command Z or Command Z is gonna be your friend. Just like the undo button is your friend in GarageBand iOS, Command Z or Z is gonna be your friend here in GarageBand Mac. Because if you do something and you do something wrong and you wanna reverse it, Command Z and it's reversed. Final, final thing that I'm gonna mention here and that is scrolling. So in terms of what is hard for me to get my head around, scrolling and zooming is one of the things. So scrolling up and down, I got my scroll wheel on my mouse, that's pretty cool. Zooming, however, I was trying to find a way to zoom with my mouse or to, to zoom in and out. You've got your zoom option up the top here. That's pretty cool, that, that does all right. But when you're just sort of moving around, moving your mouse pointer coming up to there, it's just a bit of a pain in the butt. So the one keyboard shortcut that I've learned so far is to use your command and your left and your right. So if you hold down command and you go right, it'll zoom and it'll zoom at your playhead. And if you keep zooming, you keep hitting right, it'll zoom you right down. And if you hit the left, it'll go out. And you can, of course, hold it to zoom out and hold it to zoom in. So it gives you one step and then pauses for half a second and then zooms the rest. So for me, if you're like me and when you're running around here and you're trying to get your things sorted and you're like, oh, I need to just cut that bit, you're like, oh, got to go all the way over here and do that business. Well, no, if you're on your keyboard, just grab your command key and hit the right button and then you're going to get right into here. You can do your fine little edits and your little tweaks and then you can zoom back out by just holding the command and left. 